What town in Minnesota pulled its name out of a hat? Join me as I take a walk in one of my favorite river towns, Hastings. We're starting our walk today at the southern end of downtown Hastings in Depot Park. I've included the street address in the description if you want to use your GPS to find it. From Depot Park, we'll walk the Mississippi River Regional Trail to Lock and Dam Number 2. Google estimates that this route is about 1.8 miles one way. If you like, you could return to Depot Park the same way you came. If you do, you'll walk a little over three and one half miles in about 70 minutes, according to the Google estimate. Today, however, I'm going to extend our walk. We'll continue along the Mississippi River Regional Trail as it crosses over the dike and up to the overlook on the top of the bluff. This adds some additional distance and a hill to our walk. To return to Depot Park, you can either go back the same way you came or you can proceed along the trail and take Nininger Road and 2nd Street back to Depot Park. To keep this video to a reasonable length, we'll just walk from Depot Park to the Overlook. In a future video, we'll walk from Depot Park through downtown Hastings to the Overlook. Depot Park is right next to the Hastings Train Depot. But since there's no passenger service, the depot isn't open to the public anymore. The Mississippi River Trail, the trail we're walking today, runs right through the middle of the park. Most of our walk will be along the Mississippi River. To get there, the trail jogs around the Hastings Art Space River Lofts, the building straight ahead. Before we get too far, I'd like to remind you that this video is just the highlights of my walk. I hope it inspires you to, as you age, stay physically active by walking trails like this one and to stay mentally active by being a lifelong learner. I hope something I talk about sparks your interest. Check out the resources in the description to further explore those topics. And if you enjoy this type of content and want to see more from Elder Trekker, click the subscribe button and the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. If you like this video, be sure to give the video a thumbs up. That really helps this channel. As you can see, we've reached the Mississippi River now. The trail is paved and except for the hill at the end, level. There are restrooms and water in Levy Park, the park behind downtown Hastings. Once we cross the street ahead, we'll be in Levy Park. There are restrooms at the Lock and Dam as well. One of the advantages of walking in Hastings is that it has an extensive trail system with about 30 miles of trails. You can walk for as long or as far as you like. Another advantage is that this walk can be part of a longer day trip to Hastings. After your walk, you can visit the cafes and shops in downtown Hastings, go fishing, or visit some of the other nearby attractions, such as the Alexis Bailey Vineyard or the Carpenter Nature Center. So what's the story behind the naming of Hastings? The Dakota, the Native American tribe, did not have a settlement here, but they did have a name for this place, Owobapti, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And that means the place where they dig Tipsina. Tipsina is also known as the prairie turnip, a common food source for the Dakota. Europeans first made an unplanned stop here in November of 1819. Keelboats, hauling barrels of pork, flour, and whiskey 
up the Mississippi River for the soldiers stationed near Fort Snelling couldn't proceed any further upstream because of ice on the river. U.S. Army Lieutenant William Oliver, with a contingent of nine men, was sent to guard the provisions until the ice broke up in the spring. They built a log cabin and settled in for the winter. This location was initially known as Oliver's Grove, but over the next 34 years, long after Lieutenant Oliver was gone, it was frequently referred to as Olive Grove. A pocket park in downtown Hastings, just down 2nd Street from Depot Park, commemorates the original name for this town. Oliver's Grove Park is a good place for a rest or a picnic lunch when you're in town. In 1853, when the city was being platted, the four major property owners decided the place needed a formal name. Olive Grove was considered too preposterous because olives don't grow in Minnesota. Someone suggested naming the town Sibley after Henry Sibley, the man who would be Minnesota's first governor. Sibley, however, objected because he already had a town name for him in Iowa. In the end, each of the property owners put a name in a hat. Hastings, the middle name of Henry Sibley, was a name pulled out of the hat. As a city along the banks of the Mississippi River, Hastings has endured a number of floods over the years. The columns up ahead mark the height of the crest in those years when the Mississippi River overflowed its banks. 1965 was a record year for flooding along the Mississippi. That winter and spring had the perfect combination of conditions to create a flood of historic proportions. The fall of 1964 was very cold without any snow cover, so the frost penetrated deep into the ground and remained there right into April. Storms in March dumped 30 to 40 inches of snow across the river basins in Minnesota and Wisconsin. March was also about 11 degrees colder than normal, so the snow stayed on the ground. Finally, in April, heavy rains fell, two and a half to three and a half inches. Since the ground was frozen, the water had no place to go but into the streams and rivers. The spring floods of 1965, for half the length of the Mississippi River, from 100 miles north of Minneapolis to Hannibal, Missouri, set records for the highest river crests ever recorded. And many of the records set that year still remain until today. Hastings has been the site of a river crossing almost since its inception. At first, a rope ferry carried people and goods across the river. But as the city's population and the river traffic grew, a bridge was clearly needed. The first bridge for horse-drawn wagons was built in 1895 to allow steamboats to pass underneath the bridge needed to be fairly high above the river. That created a problem. The approach to the bridge on the Hastings side of the river would then need to be quite long and bypass the downtown commercial district. To solve the problem, the engineer created a spiral ramp. When travelers crossed the bridge, the spiral ramp took them down and around, so they ended up in downtown Hastings. Oliver's Grove Park in downtown Hastings also has a mural on the adjoining wall of this bridge. The spiral bridge, as it came to be known, lasted until 1951. Its replacement was the Hastings High Bridge, which was designed to handle motorized traffic. For about 60 years, it carried Highway 61 over the river. 
but it was a fracture critical bridge, meaning if one component of the bridge failed, a significant portion of the bridge could collapse. Like the spiral bridge, there's a mural in downtown Hastings of the High Bridge. After the Interstate 35W bridge collapsed in Minneapolis in 2007, a replacement for the fracture critical Hastings High Bridge was accelerated. Construction on the latest bridge began in 2010 and was complete three years later. The new Hastings Bridge is the longest freestanding tide arch bridge in North America. We've now left Levy Park and are in J.C. Park, where Levy Park has a fireplace, labyrinth, musical playground, the Veterans Memorial, and other features. J.C. Park is focused strictly on the Mississippi River. This park provides access to the Mississippi River with a public boat dock and, a little further upstream, a public boat launch. The benches and picnic tables are a good place to watch the boats and barges as they move up and down the river. There's also a parking lot if you would rather start and end your walk here instead of at Depot Park. To my left, on the other side of the road to the Lock and Dam, is another park, Lake Rebecca Park. Lake Rebecca is an oxbow lake or an abandoned section of the river. There's a trail you can take from J.C. Park to Lake Rebecca Park. Although it's a short walk, I'm not going to walk over there today. If we would go, we'd find a fishing pier and a boat launch on the lake. I believe the DNR allows only boats with electric motors and non-motorized watercraft on the lake. According to the DNR report on the lake, it's managed as a northern pike crappie lake. They also stock it with channel catfish. And according to the DNR, there's an active bald eagle nest along the lake. It's also a good lake for canoeing. As far as I know, there's no equipment rental, so you need to bring your own canoe, kayak, or boat if you want to go out on the lake. Canoeists on the river also use the lake as a portage around the lock and dam. If you've been keeping track of the parks we've walked through, you'll know that we're now in our fourth park. We started in Depot Park, then walked through Levy Park behind downtown Hastings, then walked through J.C. Park where the boat dock and boat launch were, and we're now in the Hastings River Flats Park. If you took the trail to Lake Rebecca Park, this could be your fifth park. The Hastings River Flat Park is the area just south of the Lock and Dam. The land was originally used for agriculture and then for petroleum storage tanks. When the tanks were removed in the 1970s, the land was donated to the city for a nature preserve. Since then, a network of partners have been working to restore the native habitats. And this pier in the park provides views up and down the river. The Hastings River Flats Park is one of several areas in Hastings that are good spots to watch birds and waterfowl. In fact, it's part of an Audubon important bird area. Audubon, Minnesota also named Hastings as the first city in its Bird City program. Hastings was recognized for its long-term commitment to creating bird habitat, for reducing threats to birds, and for engaging citizens in birding, bird conservation, and outdoor recreation. The Mississippi River and the Mississippi Flyway is an extremely important area for birds. 
nearly 50% of all bird species and about 40% of all waterfowl in North America spend at least part of their lives in the Mississippi Flyway. Along this stretch of the river, about 325 different bird species have been spotted. No matter what season you come here, you're almost guaranteed to find some native, migrating, or overwintering birds. If you're interested in birding, be sure to check out the description where I've included a link to the City of Hastings website. It provides a lot of information about all the birding locations in Hastings and a list of birds seen around Hastings. We're now approaching the lock and dam. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers maintains 29 locks and dams on the Mississippi River between Minneapolis and St. Louis. The locks and dams create a minimum 9-foot deep channel that barges and tugboats use to move commodities up and down the river. In the 658 miles between Minneapolis and St. Louis, the river drops about 400 feet. Of the 29 locks and dams on the upper Mississippi River, this is lock and dam number two. The Army Corps of Engineers numbers the locks and dams from north to south. Lock and dam number one is in St. Paul. This observation platform allows visitors to watch barges and recreational boats as they're raised or lowered by the lock. The pool behind the lock and dam extends up the river all the way to St. Paul. Adjacent to the dam is a powerhouse. The turbines in the powerhouse generate enough electricity for about 3,500 homes. This lock and dam was also the demonstration site for the nation's first commercial hydrokinetic turbine. You can think of a hydrokinetic turbine as a windmill in water. The turbine generates electricity from moving water, like the flow of a river, without the need for a dam and falling water. A hydrokinetic turbine was suspended in the river from a barge downstream of the lock and dam. It increased the output of the existing power plant by about 5%. The demonstration project lasted three years before the turbine was removed from the river. I was hoping the towboat would move through the lock a little faster and we'd be able to watch the gate on the lock open, but after about 15 minutes of waiting, I gave up and continued the walk. As I mentioned earlier, you could end your walk at the lock and dam and then return to Depot Park the same way you came. On your way back, you could explore Lake Rebecca Park, walk out to the overlook on the Hastings Bridge, and spend more time exploring the Hastings Riverfront Park or downtown Hastings. The trail, however, does not end at the lock and dam. It continues alongside the river and then climbs up and out of the river valley to the top of the bluff. Today we'll stop at the overlook on the top of the bluff, but the trail continues beyond the overlook for quite some distance both to the north and to the south. Right now we're walking across an earth embankment or dike that's part of the lock and dam. The dike helps create the pool behind the dam. On the left side of the trail is Lake Rebecca Park. The trail we're walking is called the Mississippi River Trail. You may have noticed the MRT signs that we passed along the way. They denote the route of this National Bicycle and Pedestrian Trail. While the signs all say MRT, its official name is U.S. Bicycle Route 45. 
The Mississippi River Trail follows the entire length of the Mississippi River. It starts at Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota and ends 3,000 miles later at Venice, Louisiana at the mouth of the river. The Minnesota segment is about 680 miles long. Most of the trail runs on the shoulders of paved roads or on low traffic roads. Those segments of the trail are primarily used by bicyclists. Other segments, like the one we're on now, are entirely off-road and used by bicyclists, walkers, runners, and others. Since many of these segments are scenic and very popular with walkers, you'll likely see them in a future video, so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We've now come to the hill portion of this walk. The trail here leaves the river valley and then continues along the top of the bluff. I like to include hills in my walks as much as possible, but I know other walkers are not so enthusiastic about them. I like hills because they provide a little more variety to the walk. They work a different set of leg muscles, burn a few more calories, and increase my heart rate a bit. As I mentioned before, walking up this hill is optional. If you don't feel comfortable walking up a hill like this, you can certainly turn around and go back the way you came. I think it's important to enjoy whatever route you've chosen to walk. If you feel the route is too strenuous, just pick another route. The change in elevation here is about 100 feet. The trail up the hill has a switchback, so that makes it easier to walk to the top. You do need to be careful of other users, particularly bicyclists. Coming down the hill, they can develop a bit of speed and may not be able to quickly react to a walker. Over the years, I've had a few close calls. Make sure you stay on the right side of the trail. We're now at the overlook and the end of this walk. Through the trees, you can get a view of the dike and the river valley. There's a picnic table here if you want to stop and rest a while before returning to Depot Park. We've now come to the end of this walk. I hope it inspires you to stay active and to keep learning. Please check out the resources in the description if you want to learn more about the places we visited in this walk. See you in the next video.